welcome to the High Performance Podcast, Grace Bellamy. Thank you. Thanks so much for having me. Well, let's crack on then. What is high performance? Well, I think high performance for me has always been has always been about hard work and that hard work not just looking like grafting all the time but understanding when you need a rest when you need to step back when you can kind of look within yourself and look at where you need to kind of push forward um, and then you know being able to pick yourself up again and again when you don't think you're performing well when you get fa- kind of get in the face of failure or rejection um, and yeah that that to me is kind of what signifies high performance let's pick up then first of all on the on the rejection on the picking yourself up obviously we're interested to know those moments of rejection but more important than that for our audience at home is what tri- tricks and tips you learned to pick yourself up because for a lot of people get derailed once and it's over i think i mean there's that kind of golden word resilience but I think it and it's kind of probably used way too much but I think it is so important you know I didn't get into Oxford the first time and I really had to consider whether that was something I wanted because you know I thought it was always something I'd wanted and then I came face to face with it and I I didn't get it I was rejected the first time and I was rejected in a circumstance where they said oh you know any other year actually you know would have been great but not this year and I kind of thought is this a sign? Is this a reason? Um, and and then I went for it again, and I knew it was something I wanted to do. I went into work for a year, and then one went um, went back and applied, kind of while I had a full time job. And for me, that was just about recognizing: Do you still really want something? And not allowing rejection to change whether you want that, yeah. but actually, you know, sometimes you know, I've also had things I've been rejected from, and I thought actually, you know what? That was a blessing. Like I wasn't meant to do that. I wasn't meant to be doing this. It's not the right time. And being able to recognise that is the most important thing. So I think for me, it's really about checking in with myself and saying, is this still in line? If this isn't the right thing or if they don't think it's the right thing for me, do I still think it is? And then being able to either push forward or to kind of course correct and change that direction. It's interesting, isn't it? Because we speak a lot on this podcast about the fact that too many people see a failure or a stumble as a full stop. But it's not, it's a comma. Yeah, very much. And what interests me there, though, Grace, is would you explain a little bit about the context of developing that, like the role of your parents or other significant people that help you develop this art of resilience? I think, so I'd say that, you know, I very much believe that there'll be a kind of impact of the people around me. I think it'll be the impact of growing up. I think for me, my probably my growth within resilience was, you know, I was told at school that I wasn't very smart and kind of told that I wouldn't get into any of the secondary schools or 11 plus or whatever that I wanted to what age was that kind of you know just primary school and um and and, and some way to build you up yeah I (laughs) (laughs) but I I just think and I knew that um so at the time I knew that music was really my thing and that was kind of what I did and that was what I put my hard work into and then what I really realized with music was that talent is fantastic and obviously like to get anywhere in terms of music you do have to have that talent it's one of those things that re- you really do have to have but actually hard work beats that every mm. single day of the week and I think we, by by doing that music that was one thing that actually continually throughout you know from doing that to a young age and throughout school um, and then kind of going to going to you know really tough places with that music you just get rejected over and over and over and if you can't look yourself in the eye and kind of say is this something I still want yes okay I'm gonna have to go again suck it up like go again or or saying you know you can throw in the towel you can no one's making you not do that and I think for me in terms of external kind of pressure my my parents were never kind of really hands-on or saying you have to do this or you have to do this it was it was kind of the opposite of that in a way that meant you have to kind of look at yourself and think like do I want this no one's telling me I have to no one's telling me that I, but people are telling me that I can't but they're not telling me that like you really have to throw in the towel so actually looking at that and saying okay I still want this let's go and do it again and I think that when I think about it that was one of the things that really built up that resilience for me I love that and I do want to talk to you about the hard work element of that as well because I I want people to understand how important hard work is but it's not just hard work on its own it's like I always say that hard work without passion is just hard work 
and passion without hard work is just passion. It, it mm. leads to nowhere. So how do you, how did you uncover the passion and then work on that? I think, I think it's, I, my problem with passion nowadays is that I think it's almost sold in a kind of superior and ultimately incredibly achievable way, which, n not a good sentence so far, but I will get to my point. Um, I think that, you know, with the rise of kind of social media and you seeing people's careers everywhere and you seeing people fulfilling their dreams and all of that, the idea of this kind of passion and purpose, rather than being this thing that's kind of like, you know, you should be able to put into your work at different mm -hmm. points and you should be able to, yes, follow your passion and yes, that's a fantastic thing. But also I think that it can now be sold almost as a kind of like must have and it's kind of reverted this trajectory of kind of earning yeah, money, yeah. doing your work, earning your money and then getting your purpose or whatever that might be. It's inverted it so that we now want this kind of passion and purpose at the beginning of our working lives and as soon as we hit kind of 21 and come out of uni or 18 and, or 16 and come out of school is this kind of huge anxiety that you're not fulfilling your purpose because I don't think that I have a big passion I think my passion a lot of the time can be can come after the hard work when I see something's doing really well and so what I, I completely agree in the way that I think when you have a passion for something like I did for music or you know that it can be a real driving force in improving where you're going and it makes it far more enjoyable but what I think I really try and avoid saying as well is that it has to it's kind of a must-have or it's contingent on your work being worth it or whatever that might be because you know there won't be the passion when you wake up or the motivation when you wake up at 5 a.m and have to drag yourself out mm. of bed there won't be it when you're rejected there won't be it when you've had a bad day and feel like you're not good at your job so in t for me it's really been about kind of thinking okay if I'm not exactly sure what my like big overarching passion is can I just get things I enjoy into my work and then I enjoy it more and more as I work harder and harder as well. So if there's a young person listening to this then Grace what, what advice would you give them in terms of I like your idea that passion can sometimes follow mm. hard work but what advice would you give them to uh, to eventually discover that? I think I think you know I'm, I'm definitely not against the idea of passion at all. So I think the main piece of advice is just not to to try and avoid the huge anxiety around the fact that as soon as you step onto the working la ladder, it kind of has to be hyper lucrative, hyper fulfilling. This idea of what you see on kind of Instagram as people kind of living the dream, which mm. is you know I guess what is sold, is that that doesn't need to be it. Some, you know, some weeks and a lot of the time, the large majority of the time for the large majority of people, working will be about paying bills and the extra on on top of that is also really enjoying it and being able to feel fulfilled and being able to meet wonderful people and being able to kind of just make office friends and like all of that and that's all kind of part of it. So I think that the, I think a lot of what comes with passion is a lot of kind of overthinking around that and I just say, to kind of take it back to what you enjoy, how you can get that into your work, how you can, you know, there are always going to be things that you don't enjoy, like you might not enjoy your degree, but you have to do it to be able to be a doctor or you have to do it to be able to fulfill whatever career you mm. want to do. And so looking at it in a kind of long term and thinking like, how can I, what do I want to get into this at what point? And, and then making that happen rather than thinking, okay, I need to get a job next week or I've got my first job now and I, you know, I'm really not liking it. Fine, it might be t time to change it. You, there's always time to change it and there's always time to course correct and all of that. But also don't necessarily believe the hype of there always being this kind of, you know, if you love your job, you never work a day in your life. See, because that fascinates me because the, you could almost level that a lot of the image that, that you sell yeah. when you were an influencer was was precisely that. You're selling the dream. Like you weren't, like you weren't posting pictures of you getting up at five o'clock, you weren't posting pictures of you studying, it was it was the outcome rather than the hard work stuff. So I'd say a huge proportion of the things that kind of perpetuate this in our culture now are because the reward mechanisms of social media, that's what 
is kind of perpetuated. So that's what we'll do well on the newsfeed. That's what we'll do all of this. And I don't think I don't think anyone's blameless in it. And I, I think I will, have, you know, I talk about in the book a lot how much I've had a part to play in this kind of perpetuation of hustle culture and the idea of what hard work looks like and that it looks like always, you know, like working while other people are sleeping and doing all of this and no rest, all like hustle and kind of all of this. I also do think, however, that I have always been particularly mindful of the fact that, you know, when I was doing for example, when I was doing social media at university, the only way I would have been able to do it is by checking in again and being like, hey guys, still in my room writing an essay, because that's what my kind of yeah, life was yeah. like. So while I think on the one hand there was kind of that, and I've always been mindful of that, and I'm sure to some people I'll symbolise this idea of hustle culture or selling the dream or all of that, I think also on the other hand, it's a kind of culture of then what stands out. So when I will have shared the kind of down moments or the all of that, the the ones that are a lot, you know, like uh, kind of reach a lot more or do a lot better or get the press or are the kind of big announcements will always be that. So, of course, there, you know, there will be absolutely for a yeah. lot of people. And I'm sure at some points more than others, maybe when I would be feeling more insecure about how I should be sharing my life. And so I'd be trying to look like an entrepreneur and a CEO and all of that. I'm sure it will have looked different. And I guess what I really wanted to do in my book is to recognize all of that and to recognize the kind of the landscape that we're operating within in terms of social media um, and actually being able to also equip people to be able to recognise that more when they're on their social media from day to day. So have you changed then how you operate on social media? I'd say I've probably changed in terms of being more conscientious but probably more less so in the idea of re like living the dream more so in the idea of only sharing when i'm really working hard and only sharing when i'm kind of like hustling the yeah. hustle and doing this and the other because i think it creates a really unrealistic perception of work and creates this kind of idea that hard work is only about working 24 7 when actually like we're all human beings and we all need sleep mm -hmm. and we also you know taking time off a lot of the time or taking weekends will make your work better and yet this idea of work and productivity is now sold as just busyness and looking like you're kind of like always on the phone with those kind of like entrepreneur phone call pics but like and and i think for there's been an increase in conscientiousness from my perspective i'd say 100 percent, and i would definitely say that in no way have i been kind of faultless in this at all i'd say i've probably perpetuated a huge amount of it um and i think now there's definitely because you know because i mean i spent nine months writing this book and really examining all of this um and i think that there are definitely ways where i you know could have been better and then yeah. have said you know if i'm posting a photo at 2 a.m because i'm still at my desk is that because i want to prove to other people that i work hard and i want them to think that i always work till 2 a.m or is it just because i wanted to post that mm. photo and really having that kind of like secondary layer of questioning and be like okay yeah no actually that's just because i need that validation or i need that or i'm kind of insecure about you know maybe how people see me or how people take me seriously uh, and i think influencers get a bad rap right i think that people see them as an easy target for talking about all the things that are wrong with society at the moment and going on there. Look at those influence over there, they're the problem. But actually, we all do it. We're all guilty of this. Like, I will go out for a meal with my family and I'll never put my kids or anything on social media, but we'll go out for dinner. And you know those, like, you don't have children, do you? No. Right, when you do, if you do, you'll have some crap meals out, right, where <laughs> everything goes wrong <laughs> and they chuck stuff or something horrendous happens and you think, jeez, well, this is horrendous. But at the end of it, you go, come on, let's all have a photo. And all the yeah, kids yeah. sit around and smile and you take a photo. And you, we have a family WhatsApp group. So we then put that in the family WhatsApp group. And what do my brother and my sister, and my brother-in-law and sister-in-law, yeah. think of that picture? They go, oh, yeah, there's Jake with his podcast and his TV career and his perfect two little kids mm -hmm. having a lovely meal. So we actually all do this. I think what we have to do is realise that even when people like you have that moment of enlightenment, right, where you go, this is not healthy, probably not yeah. healthy for me, but definitely not he yeah. healthy for other people. Great, millions and millions of other people haven't seen that, yeah. haven't made that realization. Yeah, and yeah. loads of young boys and girls are growing up seeing edited, curated lives, yeah. comparing but them to their own. So we have to work out how we deal with it, I think, because it's always gonna be there. Even if it's not there from you, it'll be there from someone else. So do you compare? And if you don't, what 
what have you learned so you don't compare? Yeah, no, absolutely. I mean, I'd say, I'd say firstly, I completely agree. And I think the, you know, we hear about these kind of highlight reels the whole time and how social media is a highlight reel and yet we absorb mm. it in a completely different way. And I think part of that is also because, you know, even if you had a kind of 24 hour stream of someone, you wouldn't then see the next day or you wouldn't see the day before or whatever. And so it can never be fully contextualized. And I don't, I think there is a duty of everyone who, uses social media as well to be able to contextualize it for themselves and the important thing there is to be able to you know for someone like me to be able to say yeah you know this is what it looks mm. like sometimes but this is what it is and in between that time like you kind of also have to fill it with your like imagination because you know I won't be posting all the time or this person won't be posting all the time and you're so right in the way that you say that actually it's it's on every single level which is I think why I wanted to talk about it so much is because you know it's not just whoever you're following or that celebrity or you know that person who went on that show or whatever it's also like your first ever colleague or your like uncle's friend's dog or like your you know and you see all of that and that's exactly what you're absorbing and so it's never just going to be it's kind of veiled in relatability but it's it's not it's still that snapshot it's still that real but in terms of sorry to come to your question on um do i compare i think of course, and I think a lot of the time where I've actually probably perpetuated this idea of hustle culture and this idea of a kind of highlight reel and all of that will have been more when I will have been trying to prove something. So when I will have been kind of, as I said, trying to act like a CEO or act like an entrepreneur or trying to get people to take me seriously in this, that and the other way. And so there's a kind of, because that's how hard work now looks like, that's the way I need to now appear to be working hard. Right. So I now need to appear to never sleep and to never, you know, take a weekend off and to always be highly stressed out my mind, but also being able to balance having a social life and all of that. And I think those are the times where actually it's probably been more so a you know coming from my side and that's been because of comparison that's been because you know I'll see the next person who's doing a similar job to me doing you know turning over x amount or doing this campaign yeah. or doing this that and the other and they'll be doing the same to me and that's the exact same it's not just on and when you my get level. that little comparison moment what are your tools for dealing with that and reminding yourself that their their happiness doesn't take away from yours well I think in part for me, it will obviously, there's a part of it that I've spent nine months writing a book about it. So there'll be, you know, part of that that I'd say is less there for me now. But actually, it's just all about contextualization. You have to contextualize things yourself because you can't message every person and say like, oh, do you think like, like, what did you do earlier this day? Or like, is that actually what your skin texture looks like? Or do you, have you ever taken a weekend or whatever, whatever it might be? You have that duty to kind of, I guess, see your life in a different way to the way you see other people's not in a way that you're kind of lying your, to yourself or kind of making it harder for yourself to do well because you're not being honest with yourself but actually just acknowledging that actually a lot of the time what you see online mm. isn't real or if it is real it's completely removed from any context and so you didn't know the teams behind it or the makeup artists behind it or the you know all of these various different things and for me, I, you know, you, it can't be about anyone else. It just has to be about saying like, okay, I need to contextualize this. I need to get to the bottom of that for myself. So how do you determine who deserves to see the real you then? Oh, I think, I think there are a few different kind of questions in that. I guess there's a, there's an access point of view. So there's a being able to open my mind up to constantly being accessed, you know, to from from people who don't like me or don't like my work or, you know, really do and all of that. And there's an important part of, you know, I'm a business owner, so I have to be on social media and very much accept constructive criticism, not just accept, but yeah. welcome constructive criticism because that's, you know, that's how my business will improve and that's the front that I am there at in kind of social but I mean, media. You as a person. So 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 there's kind of that side and Open, but the, why I say that is because it opens up to, you know, there'll be more criticism or more okay, areas of that sure. that I then have to kind of take in as a business owner because, you know, people will come straight to you rather than customer service if they don't know that, if they know that you own the company or yeah, something on social sure. media and that access is there. I, how, uh, I think that in terms of who deserves to see the real me, probably everyone, but without necessarily, that doesn't necessarily mean that I need to 
the real you doesn't have to be the whole you all of the time. There's a kind of real me in the ups and the downs and the, all of that, which I will always share. That doesn't always, that doesn't kind of necessarily mean that I have to share at the weekends when I'm having fun rather than just working. But I'm more interested there, Grace, in who's in your inner circle, the ones oh, that, in term, in when term, they give sorry, you Sorry, I thought you meant on social media. No, no, media. sorry, I phrased it. Um, um, I mean... I, I hold kind of, I, I, I have a very kind of small close circle, but it's, you know, it's anyone who's, anyone who's been a good friend who I've worked with, all of that. Um, and so what's the criteria then that you, that when they say to you, you're getting too high on your own supply or, you know, you're, go, you're posting too many self-aggrandising uh, <laughs> posts on social media, who's the ones that you would listen to and go, you understand the context of my life, your criticism is valid? I, I mean, I'd say probably anyone that knows me in real life, I'd say. And, and kind of, yeah, anyone who knows me well in the same way, I'm, I'm sure that it's, you know, there'll be a certain perpetuation of yourself that will kind of be across or people will see on broadcast or whatever and they'll kind of put these jigsaw pieces together but it's actually only two pieces of jigsaw but they think they've seen the whole puzzle and so it's really hard to kind of say oh no you know this is what you should have come across as because you might have been briefed to do something differently or it might have been this that and the other whereas actually the people who know you in real life and who will know those answers to who you really are and can also see like okay yeah I know you're really like that but actually you're not coming across like that now is there something wrong or do you think this works better for you or whatever? Um, so yeah, I mean, I've always said that I, from from my friends and family, I probably have the, <laughs> the most apt ones for kind of the most honest like friends ever who will constantly kind of be like, you know, So what's the best like piece that. of feedback they've given you then that you've taken on board and done differently? Um, in terms of, in terms of how I come across on social media? In any context? Any advice ever? Well, from your friends, you're talking about people that are prepared to be honest with you. Yeah. What's the one I'd that say, resonates? Well, it would, I, would, I actually would say it's probably about paying attention less to what other people think online, because that's probably where people who know you in real life will see where it really, if it does really affect you. Um, and there will have, you know, over the past few years, it hasn't as much, but actually when you start out and being particularly young as well, or being kind of bombarded with all different opinions, an opinion doesn't necessarily have to be kind of trolling in order to be something that you don't necessarily want to hear. And, and therefore, when that can really affect you and your self-confidence, probably the best piece of advice then would be, would have been from my friends and just being like, just stop it. If it doesn't, you know, if it doesn't serve you or yeah. it doesn't, if it it's affecting your self-confidence or it's affecting the way you do your job just just you know like stop taking it in you have to create those boundaries for yourself so how do you do that what's the criteria you do to to not receive that criticism just being able to I guess there are some ways that you'll always receive that anyway um, and but it's about the way you deal with it so I guess being able to look at it and say okay this is one person's opinion great like I, I don't know about their life either so I'm not gonna you know so there's kind of, yeah I'd say I'd say probably um just being able to contextualize it for yourself and step back and kind of move on with your day it's an important skill to develop and it, it takes time to develop it as well I'm I'm in my 40s now and I'm only just getting to grips I'm not good at um not being affected by what I see on social media so I work in football, right? So everyone has a really strong opinion about yeah. one team or another. So no one's impartial. So you'll always come off air and you will be told by numerous people that your work is awful or you're biased or whatever. Yeah. I, at 42, I'm now able to move on from those comments and, and realise that if I pay no attention to them, I have to make a decision to also pay no attention to the positive stuff. I have yeah. to decide yeah, yeah. that everything on social media I am, I, is, is neutral to me, right? 100%. Did you ever get, because it is easy, isn't it? And I know I did. Did you ever get a bit addicted to the positive stuff and have to make that, that decision yourself? I actually, I have a whole chapter in my book right at the end about the fact that I actually kind of grew on social media at a stage where, you know, I was 18, I think it was, when I started it, and then really grew on that at a point where I was actually probably way too low in self-confidence to be getting that validation from elsewhere, mm. which meant that I thought, you know, miraculously, a year later, I was suddenly this really confident person. And then when I decided to step back from social media more and to concentrate on the businesses, that kind of miraculously evaporated because actually it was more that that was being filled by validation mm -hmm. rather than internal confidence or a belief in self-worth regardless of how well I was doing or how productive I was being or how many 
you know, people were liking my content that week. It wasn't, it, I actually wouldn't say that, it wasn't necessarily related to numbers at all. I think it was related to, because, you know, I would really share myself. And so when that validation comes in on a, on a self, on a, I guess, quite authentic self that you're sharing, you're kind of like, okay, great. It's like, you know, like the verdict's out. I'm not that bad. Like, it's all yeah. cool. And actually then I realized when I decided to step back and when I decided to concentrate on these other things and when that wasn't there as much because I wasn't putting things out, I was kind of like, oh, it wasn't that I was suddenly super confident. Actually, a lot of this was because I was allowing external validation to fill up self-worth. So I'm the father of a, of, a, of a young daughter, as Jake is, and this is quite a selfish question, but mm -hmm. from our point of view, as fathers of young girls then, what can we be doing to, to almost water their self-esteem and, and not requiring them to have validation from those kind of external factors? I think it's very difficult and I think it will probably apply to um, both young yeah, young girls and boys, I'd say. Um, I completely see how it would be particularly um, kind of exacerbated um, on the women's side, especially how like women are received in the media um, and kind of perceived in the media. Um, but I'd, I'd say it has to be about developing a self-worth that is unconditional in comparison to other things. So I guess as you go, as you go through life, you, you realise that actually you know, you can be less than impressed with yourself, but you still have to have this idea of self-worth. You're still, like, worth appreciation and acceptance and love and all of these things. And that's not tied to whether you lost your job. That's not tied to whether you actually missed that deadline or, or any of that. And you have to be, and that's kind of something we build up. I think now, however, before we build that up, a lot of the time that is filled with things like external validation that are really quick hits to that self-worth. They're really quick kind of boosts. So I think it, I, I think... I definitely don't have the answers and I don't think it can be just about saying, oh, well, you need to not go on social media because that's not helpful. You need to be on LinkedIn to get a job. You need, your yeah. business needs to be on social media to do well now. So ignoring the existence of it isn't going to help. What is going to help, I guess, is the education around the effects of social media and how you can, rather than just kind of demonizing the platforms altogether, actually acknowledging how you can deal with it better and what your relationship is. We all need to be asking mm. ourselves, not just young people, not just women, we all need to be asking ourselves as well how it particularly affects us when we're in low or when we're yeah. kind of feeling in a really great mood and that's what I had to do I had to literally write down a questionnaire of like how do I feel when I post this how do I feel after a bad day when I post do I feel better that's probably like not good that's probably I should be finding that elsewhere by going out to dinner with my friends or something and asking those questions I think is the only way we're going to get around it because we can't just say like no, just don't use social media. That's not yeah, an op sure. it's not an option now, or it is, but it's not going to get you the same opportunities, or it's not going to get you the same. You know, like in friend groups now, I'm sure at school, they kind of have to be in order to get invited to things, in order to do all of that. So I don't think the way the best way to combat it is to just say like, oh, don't do it. Yeah, I think part of the risk is the importance that social media has in your life, and I want to move on and talk about your brilliant and successful businesses, and I wonder whether actually building those businesses has really helped on the social media thing because if all you're about is sharing 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 and you're getting positive which makes you feel good and negative which makes you feel bad like there's no foundations there right when you start to create a business as successful as the businesses that you've done actually suddenly that means less because there's something else that means more and that thing that means more is real like you've created it you've built it it's your baby and i wonder whether that actually helped to change your mindset I think that was why I needed to change my mindset. Yeah. I think that's what really made me realise. I was like, okay, I rely on this validation and yet I feel better from this than actually when I look at the back end and realise that this is doing amazing. And I wouldn't really. I would like look at it and be like, no, this one does make me happier. But this one's instant gratification. It's a quick fix. It's all of that. Mm. And so I think in part, yes, you're right in that I had to, you know, part, you know, lots of that is... I guess, very exciting. And that's why I think that we don't necessarily want to demonize the platforms altogether because it's also it can make amazing things happen. I mean, these businesses yeah. have, have been grown. Their marketing has been almost entirely um, on social media, at least initially was at the beginning. Um, and 
those things as well kind of need to be celebrated too. So I think for me that was really important and kind of just being like, yeah, you know, this is great and you've done this and you can see that you've done this and that's not about, you know, how you look or how you come across in this way or anything. Um, so that was important. Right, business. Okay. You go to university. <laughs> um, for a lot of people, going to university, trying to get a degree, that's like enough, okay? Somehow you had two things. The spare capacity to find the time to create businesses, but the self-belief that it was something that you could do. I'm interested to know where the self-belief came from. Was there a moment where you were at uni and you go, I'm just going to set up my own <laughs> brand here in my spare time? I'd do you say, remember the moment? I'd, I'd say there definitely wasn't that moment. And I'd say, actually, I get asked a lot about kind of self-belief and taking the leap of faith and all of that. When you contextualise my story, my story was about the fact that my student finance didn't come in. I was told I was suspended from the university and I had to make some money. And I was already, I already had this platform of around 100,000 followers, I think, at the time. And I thought, right, <laughs> like, I, I'm already putting out this content. How can I make something that is worth money, not just something that can be yeah. free online? How is it going to help people? And how yeah. can, you know, it be something that I feel great about selling? Because, you know, as I've said, I'm not, I, I don't do things by half. So I'm going to, you know, I, I went home that night after calling the bursar in hysterics, kind of saying, like, is this is this okay? What's going to happen? And they, you know, my official email said, like, after the 10th of January, you will not be allowed on campus. And I kind of thought, well, <laughs> fuck, <laughs> I'm really going to need to be allowed. Um, and I called student finance and everything. And they said, look, it's going to be fine. Thanks for letting us know that it's a delay on their side and that you're not paying for it. I was like, where am I getting that money from? Um, but, and, and I hoped it would come in in time, but I basically said, you know, at least I can you know, cobble together something or if I'm mm. not going to be at university or whatever it might be. And so I went home that night and I wrote this entire, I think it was eight week guide with like full, it was a, it was very long. It would be thousands and thousands of words um, and put it on and, and got my friend who was a graphic design student to design it up because I don't think like things not looking nice. Um, then made myself a Shopify website um, and then, um, and then actually partnered with a company, stop my Shopify website because I partnered then with a company who was going to do all the customer service and um, right. do the website and everything and then stuck that up on sale two weeks later um, and within the first two days I'd sold a thousand copies at £35 each of, what? of this of this guide um, this fitness right, guide okay. so um, it was a fitness guide it was a fitness guide that was sort of, actually I'd done something else that you the year wrote before in one evening that I'd wrote in no it was about I, it was a stint it was a, as no if you've way. got like a dissertation due tomorrow it was an energy drink full-on stint and then I perfected it over the next few weeks it absolutely wasn't just in that time wow. do you think you'd have ever done it if you hadn't been forced to with if out of desperation do you know what I think not as quickly I, I had it in my mind that's why I was able to come up with it that evening and it was going to be something I was going to do later but because at the university I went to it were, you were not allowed to have a part-time job the idea is that the terms are so short that you can have a part-time job outside of that I have yeah. views on that I don't think it's very fair but that was the existence so if I was going to have a part-time job of some form it was going to have to be something that um, you know for each bit of you know each guide that went out there was no more work for me unless it was a kind of customer service issue or whatever that might be um, and also something that I could fully wholeheartedly say at all times that my number one priority was university because otherwise yeah. I'd be kicked up for another reason so that was you know that was really important for me and I think the that's why I like drawing attention to it because I actually think I've given a lot of credit for this kind of like leap of faith and all of this it's like I didn't have to lo lose my day job I didn't need to kind of leap onto this or that or anything yeah. I had to make something work and yes it was resourceful and yes I'm very glad I did it and yes I then was able to replicate what the good was in that and make it into x amount more products that did fantastic well and ultimately grew into what Shreddy my first business is now um, in all of that there wasn't this kind of like big moment of like you can do this so you should do this brilliant so there's a great line that you said there because like you can do it once and be lucky but then you replicated it over and over again and you said that I worked out what made it successful mm -hmm. so I could replicate it would you tell us more like one of our yeah. our favourite phrases on this podcast is success leaves clues. Yeah, oh, I really like that. I really like that as a phrase. Um, so for me, it has been so true that you, I mean, literally that success leaves clues. It's the idea that I have tried so many things that have not worked and 
what looks like my business is now is the sum total of all the things that have worked done again and again and again or tweaked slightly, made improvements, fixed problems or come into an industry. My second business was a very disruptive business that came into an industry that I believed already had problems. So someone else's success left clues for me there. So the important thing there is being able to test things and replicate that based on what works and based on you know how you can further that. So a lot of the time you'll create a product that yeah people might like but you have certain complaints or people think oh I didn't buy it because of this. Getting that information is fantastic mm -hmm. because that's exactly how you can replicate um, and I always say you know within my businesses the way we often work is about testing and learning so this kind of test and learn approach of you know we're going into more email marketing so we're going to test this we're going to learn based on that we're going to start advertising out of home so we're going to test it we're going to learn from it did it convert Probably not because it's out of home, so it's not based on conversion, it's actually based on exposure, all of these various different things. And you need to be able to do that and you need to be able to, so I guess, I mean, in that as well, there wasn't one big leap of faith, but there are continuous, constant, every week, multiple little leaps of faith of being like, let's try that shit, okay? It didn't sure. work. And, and that's what you hear again and again. And I'll tell you why that's important, because I said this to Damien actually yesterday, sometimes I get people that I don't believe have listened to this podcast, right? Because I'll say, oh, Grace Beverly's on the pod this week. You've got to listen to it. And someone will come back. I don't want to listen to another person with their amazing success story. And I always will go back to those people and say, listen, you haven't listened to the podcast. Because this isn't, this isn't survivorship bias. This isn't just the successful people where they've tried one thing, it's worked. And they think that's the answer. What is great about the message there is you've tried stuff, you've failed. You've tried again and failed. You've gone down this avenue and realised it's not for you. And I actually think that that is a recurring theme right from your very beginnings really is that you learn as I said at the beginning of this podcast that failure and struggles is yeah. not a full stop it's a comma and we all have to almost expect struggles and failures we young people think they're on the wrong path when they have those and they're not yeah. they're an inevitability aren't they but I think also there's I'm not going to go back fully to the social media thing but I think it's important then as well when you look at it and you say like you see the successes you don't see the failures that leave again mm. and again all people will have seen products that you know we don't sell anymore like when I sold like a t-shirt of merch back in the day or you know all of these things that you just don't come with you and are things you kind of learn from and actually that's the important thing you have to learn that yeah. it's just not always about that it's about and I think you know I would say actually if I had to pinpoint one of the things that has made me do well is because I feel like I failed a lot when I was younger yeah. and it was kind of it's not just that it's not a full stop like it couldn't have been a full stop because you have to continue you yeah. have to do better you have to just get that fight and like make it happen so does failure derail you at all I mean I think it probably derails me a bit but I think I have probably slight a slight kind of toxically positive attitude now towards failure in the same way as you know the day I didn't get into Oxford I applied for my job at IBM that I worked mm. in the next year um in order to be able to go to apply again um and I kind of have this like okay like that didn't work on to the next like you know make that work and I think sometimes actually I probably could take a step back and kind of you know because I was going to say that that like even emanating from you as we're meeting you there's a real energy <laughs> that, like a hum of energy that comes from you so when do you give yourself that time to pause, reflect, and do the analysis that failure demands of us? Probably not enough. Ever? Um, Ever? I, I do, I do. So I, I made a rule a year and a half ago now, at the beginning of 2020, to, um, to take weekends, which sounds insane. Um, but it was actually that was my kind of like hard and fast rule, no way around it, always gonna do it, unless it's like a big crisis, in which case, you know, having a business, you can't really decide when they fall. Um, well, explain what, to take week, like not so, to... So to not work on weekends at all, no ifs, no buts, work phone isn't there, everything you is look at social outside of that. Um, I don't have notifications on. So I don't have notifications on anyway, but you know, as in, I really try to be beyond that. It's different in lockdown, there'll be things like, what do you do? Um, yeah. But but yeah, kind of that was one of it. And I really try that. And I think in being able to step back in that way, even if it's not a kind of like, this is a list of achievements I've done this week, it's actually being able to acknowledge as well and just to be able to spend a bit of time away from things. And I think that, you know, that being completely honest, that's something I really want to work on. And I talk yeah. about it within the book too, is the idea of internalizing success and actually allowing yourself to acknowledge, accept and celebrate success even if it's only with like an under desk fist pump. It doesn't need to be about like popping a bottle of champagne and it usually isn't. I mean half the success I'll have will come in the middle of the work day 
champagne. I'm not popping champagne. Um, <laughs> but like, it is just about, you know, being able to say like, that was good. That was great. Because otherwise you only pay attention to yourself when you're failing or you only pay attention to yourself when you need to like, yeah. ki like kick yourself and kind of be like, do better, work harder or have a bit more discipline. And so for me, it was actually, I kind of felt that I was really leaning on one side. And actually one thing I would really like to do better is to internalize that and to kind of think, you can sit back and you can just have like, yeah, still work, but like have a few days where you think like, okay, I don't need to think about what's next. I don't need to think about how I'm going to maintain this. I don't need to think about longevity. I don't need to think about what's my next big thing so that, you know, this and that and the other lasts. I can just sit there and say like, that was good. That was great. Well done. It's very difficult, isn't it? I'm very much of the same mindset. I've got all these different sort of hats that I wear. And I, I always say that successful people can wear many hats. I love the fact that I can be dealing with a, a startup one day, a production company the next, a podcast the next day, a bit of live TV. Like, I take a thrill from that. But I also am absolutely certain to, at some point every single day, just stop, even if it's yeah. only for half an hour, and just be like, right, are you, are you happy with the direction of all these little bits? Do you make sure you give yourself that kind of headspace at the end of the day, lay your head on the pillow, assess? Like, um, no, but I probably should. <laughs> you know, you've <laughs> Ultimately, never done it. Um, I mean, I think, I mean, I'm sure I have, but as in, I don't think it's a part of my every day, and I yeah. think it really needs to be. I think it would give myself much better boundaries around the idea of success um, because if you don't allow yourself acknowledge, to acknowledge it then it's only about mm. making the announcement or you know celebrating rather than actually being about like cool you did that like that's great yeah. I, I used to struggle with the downtime a lot because I felt like I'm not being productive now and other people are and it's starting to slip and stuff and my father-in-law my wife Harriet's dad just said to me listen another way of looking at the word recreation is recreation and that was a brilliant moment for me because I thought, yeah, do you know what? If I'm just going out for a walk, walking the dog, playing with the kids, there's something in that for yeah. everyone. And I, I think we should really talk about the side hustle because I am actually concerned that we are going to have a whole generation of people that are just burnt out husks at the age of 35 because it isn't for everyone. And there is an expectation that it is for everyone and yeah. should be for everyone. So I... I have some views <laughs> about the. I thought you might, you know. The, I, for some reason, I thought you might have a few. <laughs> That's so that. strange. I can't believe that. Um, but but I think that there's there's kind of two sides to this. So I think that there's nothing inherently bad with the idea of a side hustle. And I think, mm -hmm. on the one hand, it's hugely opened up the kind of breadth of opportunities for this generation, for my generation, for um, the older generations, for any, anyone who can, you know, on social media you can start a side hustle, you can do this, you can do that. And then I also think that on the other hand it creates this very real anxiety that every second that we're not working, you know, I say in the book it's the equivalent of being in the office and taking a nap because you should be constantly working, you should be constantly creating. Or And also in this time you're then not spending working, the opportunity cost of resting is now really high. You know, you could be driving Uber, you could be selling on Depop, you could be starting your own business, you could be doing all of these different things to further yourself, mm. which means that we completely forget that rest is also furthering yourself and that stepping back is also furthering yourself and that going to the pub with your friends is also furthering yourself when yeah. you also have the discipline on the other side of that. And that's what worries me. I will be the first to say that side hustles are fantastic. I started my businesses through side hustles. I started them while I was, well, it wasn't my main thing. And so I'm definitely not going to sit here and be like, they're not great. They are great. And I think in a lot of circumstances as well, they enable people to take creative avenues when they wouldn't have the financial security to do or to do so otherwise yeah. or whatever it might be. But yeah, I think there is the other side that we do need to talk about. That's this idea of kind of there was, I think there's this like Alex Collison quote from like an article which, yeah, which essentially says like, when do we start calling a side hustle, a second job like a side hustle? Mm. And actually that it's important. It's important to talk about and important to evaluate, okay, there's a great part of this, but there's also a part of this that creates a wider problem for the way we work and the way we think about work and rest. The issue for me is expectation. It just isn't for everyone and I don't want... Mm. Yeah my kids growing up thinking actually I have to do it you know in, in the same yeah. way as like starting a business is not for oh. everyone honestly if you told me half of the shit that comes into starting a business Absolutely. before I'd done it I mean 
I probably still would have done it, but I would have gone in a lot slower. I would have gone in a lot with a lot more, I guess, consideration. And I definitely wouldn't have started my second business so soon after. And while I'm so grateful that everything's turned out the way it has, there's also been so much within that that I've almost exploded and that I've just thought, this is so much responsibility every single day and you can't decide, you can't I think you love it, take though. that mental... I, I do, I thrive I think, off it. I think this is and your that's energy the problem. source, isn't but it? It absolutely is, and that's probably the problem for me, because then I don't. I also love the time off and the celebration and stuff, but I get so much more instant gratification and, and delayed gratification, probably gratification in general mm. and fulfilment in general from this business side. But it's definitely not for everyone, and it shouldn't be there are kind of so many different things that you can do to get you know similar results but also sometimes the cost of that in terms of emotional energy in terms of the time you have in terms of the responsibility you have constantly and always for other people's livelihoods for their mortgages yeah. for the way they feed their families is not going to be for everyone and it shouldn't be advertised as for everyone so here's an interesting question for you then because jake and i were talking before we met you around are you familiar with the philip tetlock decision making uh, analogy he talks about the fox and the hedgehog um yes but i haven't heard it recently so i will need a recap right yeah sorry he's, he's a psycho he's a famous psychologist that talks about how we make decisions based on some people make decisions like it's like a hedgehog where you focus on just one thing to did you to, know hedgehogs were that focused i didn't no, but so, I didn't know. they're <laughs> yeah. cute but didn't yeah. know they were that of, focused <laughs> of, of foxes know lots of things about lots of things they've got a wider interest and it's not that one is better than the other. How would you describe yourself? Oh, I'd say I'm probably a fox, which I think also leads to the problems of, you know, as I, I was kind of saying before we started the podcast, I think one of the most important things for me to do is to really hone in, not on those details, because I have painful attention to detail, but actual kind of honing in, going deeper and deeper and asking more and more questions rather than just expanding into more things. And that's been a real concentration of mine has been like, okay, well, you've now got two businesses and a personal brand that has X amount of work. So what can you do to dive deeper into those rather than being like, new thing, like yeah, shiny yeah, yeah. new thing. And yeah. that's one of my big weaknesses. Are you a control freak? Yes. <laughs> so <laughs> My assistant just nodded. <laughs> <laughs> so if you know you've got blind spots, mm -hmm. do you fill those blind spots with other people or do you not trust other people to fill those blind spots for you? So I'd say that you have to trust other people to fill those blind spots, otherwise you have something as big as yourself. So you have yeah. to be able to delegate these things and you might be delegating them to the wrong people, but actually, initially, it probably just needs a bit of time ramping up and to be able to properly trust people with them. But actually you need to, unless you want something that is just as big as yourself, mm. which is absolutely fine, like there is so much validity in that as well. If you're trying to grow something or if you're trying to have a business or whatever, you can't be micromanaging and you can't be refusing to delegate because you want to do everything. Otherwise, you're just, you're just doing that. Yeah, it's just yeah. you, it's just all of that. Whereas when you can take people's expertise, so I always say that you know everyone within my business, because I'm especially young as well, almost everyone within my business is older than me. I say in one business everyone is, in the other business almost everyone is. And they, so they all have more experience than me in their particular area. Now that won't be the same for everyone, obviously I know it's a specific case. Mm -hmm. However, if you can lean on that expertise, you create, you go from being like this size to being like this size because you've taken this person's expertise, this person's expertise, and their time as well. They're being, you know, they're spending yeah. their work week doing that. So you can infinitely expand the breadth of what you can actually do and I think for me it's about being a control freak on the things I need to be a control freak on so product brand these things that actually they if they're not control freak then it's not it's not my brand or it's not shreddy or it's not Tala and it's not what those businesses were built to be but there's a way that I can kind of delegate within that too and beyond that <laughs> it needs to be outsourced so on one of the earlier series of the podcast uh, Grace we interviewed Holly Tucker from the not on the high street mm, business. Yeah, and, yeah, yeah. And she spoke really, really passionately about how uh, Sophie Cornish, her business partner, was the ying to her yang. And I've read that you had uh, a business partner that came in when you, that 
approached you when you first launched your business. What does he do that complements these blind spots for you then? So in the so just to clarify what we're talking about, in the in the first year, so what I when I started what Shreddy is now, um, as I said slightly earlier, someone came to me and they said, like, we can run the website and the back end and do the customer service and all of that. And I was at I was like for, I think it was about two weeks, I was like, no, no, until they actually got me to sign on with like a bonus of signing on because they were like, this is going to do really well, like, you should get involved. And being able to, I, I thought at the time I was like, I'll be able to do anything because if they just have a problem, I can just send them the ebook or I can, you know, just give them a discount code for their next yeah. thing or whatever it might be. And I so didn't see the benefit in that. And I was like, I'm not giving this away or I'm not, you know. And so that was all about operations and outsourcing that. And I've had that kind of throughout my career in various different things. There'll be times where you outsource paid marketing or times when you outsource HR or times when you outsource financial um, kind of modeling and all of that. And that is, it's so important to learn how beneficial that is because without that, you, you know, as I say, you're creating something as big as yourself or you're letting your ego get in the way of the fact that it could actually be done better. Ego is so dangerous, right? So dangerous. When when everything becomes about Grace Beverly, that's that's when. Isn't it? Ah, <laughs> right. <laughs> Stop recording. <laughs> it's, a, it's a real. It's a genuine risk, though, isn't yeah, it? Yeah, yeah. So no, a hundred percent. What often stops that? I think is is this thing of imposter syndrome. I know you've spoken about it. You've written about it. How is your relationship with imposter syndrome these days? So my relationship with imposter syndrome, I'll be pleased to and I'm pleased to announce, has completely changed. And this was after an article I read in Harvard Business Review, which was to top, to, no, if I can speak, um, to stop telling women they have um, imposter syndrome. And I read it and I was kind of thinking, like, but I definitely have imposter syndrome. Yeah. And what I've realized is that I have self-doubt in certain situations. However, I don't have imposter syndrome. And the reason they set this out was they were, um, it's written by two incredible women and they were saying, actually, why, do, if we're saying this many women have imposter syndrome, why do this many women have imposter syndrome? Is it potentially because workplaces aren't set up or aren't managing well enough having women in the workplace or having black women in the workplace or making it a place where these people want to or feel safe working or can see people in yeah. the rooms that look the same as them and as soon as that came out and as soon as I read that I was kind of thinking actually yeah I have self-doubt about certain things and I think kind of like can I do that or is this meant to be me should I really accept this opportunities that I've got because I don't feel like I'm good enough for it whereas actually I think a lot of the time when it's imposter syndrome or what I see as imposter syndrome would come in it would be instead because you know because I don't see any uh, mm. you know other 24 year old women doing it or because I'm not taken seriously in certain situations or whatever it might yeah. be and I've kind of had to reframe that for myself and also have wanted to reframe that within my organization is making sure people don't feel that when they're in higher up positions they have that imposter syndrome is it because you know I've been sitting in a boardroom and have never been addressed when the man sitting next to me is constantly addressed and I'm the one that makes the decisions yeah and usually the case is being able to break it down and kind of saying huh okay actually like I have self-doubt about certain things and I have kind of resistance and boundaries around this um, and other times people and, and and the women who are so constantly told they have imposter syndrome are actually the workplaces aren't, you know, made for them and they don't have good enough maternity leave or they don't, you know, yeah. set up places that mean that they can, you know, do this, that and the other. So we read an interesting stat before you came on about that only one in five businesses are run by women mm -hmm. or only 9% of business loans are accessed mm -hmm. by women. So if we're going to reframe it and sort of get rid of this idea of imposter syndrome doesn't really exist, it might be self-doubt. What, would you, what advice would you give to any women listening to this that maybe have a dream of becoming independent that, that you've learned? Well, I think... They're depressing numbers, by the way. They're very depressing numbers, and the numbers on funding for women in businesses gets more and more depressing, if you'd... <laughs> it's yeah. very fun to read. Um, yeah, I'd say don't believe you are an imposter. You're not an imposter, and if you feel like you are an imposter, why is that? Is that because you can't see anyone sitting in the position you're in? Is it because you've been taught to kind of be secondary or whatever it might be, and really analyze that 
and and but there'll still be self doubt. There'll still still be areas where, and also I think I still have self doubt in areas where because I actually I'm not very good at that. And so self doubt's not unhealthy. Exactly, though. and it's not, and it, it gives you fight on the one mm. hand, and it also gives you like a lot of the time self doubt for me will kick me out the ass to actually like mm -hmm. get better at something that I need to get better mm. at. Um, and so I'd say it's about analysing the situation, but I, I mean. Ultimately, at the end of the day, the statistics need to go better, get better. And I think what we also need to do is to reframe f away from asking women. I mean, I think it's important to ask women what they can do to better situate with themselves within those examples. But I also think it's important not to put the onus on women for what they can do differently to not feel like that. And instead, put the onus on people to be better at making sure that funding's there, making sure they're lifting people up when they can, making sure they're saying people's names in, people, in mm. rooms they aren't in and all of those things that can actually structurally improve. And I think that it's great for you to sit here um, as a female entrepreneur and talk about this, but I think there's a, a really strong role for men as well. I think that, that men have to decide to be an ally for women, basically, mm. and they, they have to say the right things and do the right things, not necessarily when there's a woman sitting in front of them who wants a loan or wants to set up a business or is an entrepreneur, but all the time. Mm. Yeah. I think it's not just about women fighting for women, like. Yeah, a hundred percent. And they'll, you know, I've never gone for funding. My businesses are self-funded, and they've been, um, and and kind of, the difference will be. I can only sit here and say a certain amount, especially as a white woman, especially as someone who, you know, went to Oxford and all of these things. And there will be, you know, it will affect other people so much more. And that's why it's also important that I do the exact same as well. Mm. So when I talk to people who say like, we'd love to invest in your business. Okay, look at that business. Like that's doing, you know, fantastically and really using that as well, I think is very important from my point of view. It's brilliant. Oh, I've loved sitting here and having this conversation. <laughs> um, we've reached the quick fire round. Three <laughs> non-negotiable behaviours that you and the people around you have to buy into to be part of your journey. Kindness. And you can tell us why briefly. Okay, kindness, because I think kindness goes a long way regardless of situation, person, anything. No. Um, and I guess comes into that manners and politeness. Big one of mine. Um, and then I'd say um, discipline as well, I think is really important. I think that complaining is tough without discipline. There are things you complain about and you can constantly, and I will all the time, but I also think that it's very important to understand what you can do to change that as well. It won't always be your fault, but there, a, a lot of the time you also can look at that and say like, okay, what could I do better? Um, and then, humour would probably be my last one because it's nothing without humour. Absolutely. What advice would you give to a teenage Grace just starting out on a journey? I think it's difficult because I think teenage grace now is grace now because of teenage grace but I'd say you know there's part of that that I really wish I had this unconditional view of self-worth that actually didn't wasn't altered by my grades or whether teachers were telling me I was doing well or whether I got that audition or any of that and actually understanding that that yeah it might knock my self-confidence but it shouldn't knock my self-worth that worth is there unconditionally. Love that. How important is legacy to you? Oh, I'd say not very important. I'd say for me, my legacy, I hope, will be among my friends and family who will think I was hopefully a kind, generous and fun person to be around. And other than that, um, as much as I'd like to, you know, build something for the people around me, I think it's less so about being known for something for me other than with those people. Mm. I think that matters most, probably. Nice. So can you suggest one book that our listeners Ooh. should really read? Um, okay. I love Educated by Tara Westover. Why? I read that quite recently, so I think I've now recommended that twice. Um, but that I think it's a really, re so it's a memoir. It reads like a novel, so it's really easy to read, you know, when you're not necessarily forcing yourself through a non-fiction book, apart from mine, obviously, because it's very easy to read. Um, <laughs> but no, I think that it's really, really important in, um, it's, it's such a different view 
of life. She mm. grew up um, with her parents pre preparing for the end of the world and kind of spending all their money on cans so that they could like hide in the um, like fields and all of that. And it's a completely different way of life. And she and they didn't believe she could go to school because it was the government trying to get into their heads and everything. And it's beautifully written. It's such a great read, and it really contextualizes a lot of things um, in terms of you know different backgrounds and and just yeah, it's just fantastically written to be honest. Before we let you go, um, have you got one golden rule to leave our viewers and listeners with for living their own high performance life? I'd say that sometimes productivity is a form of self-care and sometimes self-care is a form of productivity. I think it's important. Self-care is not spoken enough when it comes to high performance no. and high achievement. Um, and I'm now going to totally ruin the conversation about self-care and looking after yourself by talking very briefly, because yeah. I really wanted to touch on this and we haven't, about relentlessness. It comes up every time we speak to an entrepreneur. Steven Gerrard, the, the footballer and now manager, used the phrase which I absolutely love, all in. Are you all in and do you need to be all in to be an entrepreneur? I think you have to be all in in terms of discipline. And I don't think that always, I don't think that is antithetical to self-care. I think that self-care, that sometimes is self-care because you are... Yeah. Understanding that you want something. No, no. And sometimes being all in is a form of self-care because you're understanding that you want something and you're making that happen. That right. is self-care. Self-care is not just about face masks and getting the bath and all of that. I think that's really, really important. Um, so I think you need to be all in in that kind of understanding that if you're going to do something, do it yeah. and make it happen. And that doesn't mean that you, you know, relentlessness doesn't mean that you never rest or you never sleep. Otherwise, it wouldn't exist because we're all humans and we all need to sleep. Um, and so I think, I think, you know, I definitely say I am all in. And the important thing for me is recognising that all in doesn't mean doing it all the time. Brilliant. Thank you so much for coming on the podcast. Thank you for having it's, me. Um, it's so good because it's so clear that you've spent all these years on this journey and you, you, you're able to put the pieces together as to how you got there and even more important than that you're able to very eloquently explain to us how you put the pieces together so thanks for your time and one of Damien's favourite phrases is some people light up a room when they're in it some light up a room when they leave and you've definitely brought such energy oh, to this thanks. podcast I think it's more so. the lights but <laughs> the lights are helping all of us at the moment <laughs> particularly those tired dads you know, yeah. sitting here but um, like from both of us and all the team thank you well, thank yeah. you thank so you. much thank you please hit subscribe, hit the notification bell, give us a thumbs up, leave a review, but somehow get involved with the High Performance Podcast and become part of our growing community. Thanks for being part of the adventure.